Hi, welcome back to Mountain Murders. Hey, how are you? I'm doing wonderful. How are you tonight? You had a good week, good weekend? Yeah, great time. Ready to get started with a brand new episode? I am. Yeah, so we have a lot of great feedback with our Peter London um, episode, which was kind of like, um, I guess we were on hiatus, came back, so it was kind of like our first big episode back. Yeah, and that was a fan recommendation, and um, thank her, because it was a really great story. Yeah, and so we've got a lot of new fans, and we've had some really good feedback. Um, folks saying that they've binge, binge listened to the entire podcast so far. They love it. They can't put it down. It's great. They can't wait for the next episode. We are so happy to hear that. Yeah, that means a lot to us. It really does, especially, you know, we're podcast fans, and so having people who listen and enjoy what we're putting out is great. Yeah, to hear someone say they binge listened all in a day or two, um, yeah, that's pretty exciting to me because that's what I do when I find one I love. And if you're a fan and you love the show, of course, you can always support us um, with Patreon, becoming a patron. And we had a brand new patron this week, so shout out to Casey Barton. Thanks for uh, joining us here and being a patron and uh, giving us your hard-earned money because, of course, with support from uh, our fans, we're able to upgrade equipment, you know, hosting, domains, all that stuff that goes into uh, putting together a podcast. Yeah, thanks, Casey. Yeah, so thank you, Casey Barton. And if you're interested in becoming a patron, all you have to do is find Mountain Murders on Patreon. We have some very affordable levels there. A couple of bucks a month, you can support the show. Yeah, and we're coming up with new ideas every day on uh, extra bonus content. We're just going to get it chocked full of all you can stand of different things. Us run our mouth. Yeah, and that's the thing with Patreon. Uh, Patreon, if you become a patron, is that when we post those bonus episodes, you actually get a first access to that before everybody else. So, again, if you can't get enough of this Mountain Murders True Crime podcast, then you can definitely sign up there. So, you ready to get started with this crazy story? I am. Very, very excited to hear about this one because I didn't know much about it. Yeah, well, I've actually known about this case for probably like 20 years or so. My best friend, her name is Julie. Um, we heard about this case, gosh, probably back when we were in college at Western Carolina University. And we researched it and we were really fascinated with it. And we've even heard some like paranormal types of stories that kind of go along with this case. But that's, a, of course, maybe for a bonus episode or something. Uh, yeah, we have to bring that up in our Mountain Murders Afterthoughts. Exactly. <laughs> but this uh, case has sprung, um, you know, a murder ballad. Uh, there's been documentaries and several books written about this case. And it takes place here in the mountains of North Carolina. And this is sort of in the northwestern part of the state. Um, Walnut Grove, North Carolina, which is in Stokes County, I guess kind of between like Winston-Salem, Greensboro. Yeah, I guess it would be uh, east of us a little bit. And then um, north of the Greensboro, Winston-Salem area. Yeah, but back, still a mountain murder. Back in the mountains. They have some very beautiful places there. And a lot of people have kind of dubbed this story as the Christmas tragedy. Are you ready to get started, Dylan? Yeah, let's do it. So on December 25th, 1929, so we're taking it uh, back a few decades. What is that, almost 100 years or so? Yeah, we're getting in the way back machine. The way back machine. So 17-year-old Marie Lawson woke up early to bake a Christmas cake for her family. And she knew that the two layers were going to take some time to bake cool, frost, all of that, uh, before the holiday festivities were to happen later in the day. Now, you got to keep in mind this is 1929, and you pointed out she was probably baking on a wood stove. Yeah, so she's got, a, she's got a lot to get going before she can even bake the cake. Exactly. So, gets up early to start this Christmas cake. So, sometime later on in the morning after, you know, the family's been up, Marie's baking this cake. I'm sure the smell of the cake was kind of filling the house, um, you know, making people rise and shine. Um, her two younger siblings, um, Carrie and Maybell, departed the property to go visit their aunt and uncle because, of course, it was Christmas morning. So they were going to walk over to relatives' house, wish them a Merry Christmas, and then come back and probably have a piece of cake. <laughs> yeah, probably looking forward to that cake. Well, lurking in the tobacco barn on the property, a killer laid in wait. And the Lawson family murders is a tragedy that has haunted a community for 
90 years. So let's get started with this. Charlie Lawson, also known as Charles Davis Lawson, was born May 10th, 1886. So now he's going to be the patriarch of this family. Um, he was born in Lawsonville, North Carolina, to William George Augustus Lawson and Nancy Hill Lawson. And in 1911, he married Fanny Manring. What a name. You reckon his people founded Lawsonville? I mean, probably. Probably connected to the people that founded it at least, huh? Well, you know, with these small mountain towns, they're often named after the folks who settle in those towns right. kind of to begin with. And, um, yeah, that's just sort of the way of the, the woods here. So Charlie marries Fanny, and he's a sharecropper. So he's working as a sharecropper, and he worked uh, as a tobacco tenant farmer for you know quite a few years before eventually saving enough money to buy his own farm. And he, he ended up moving from Lawsonville to this Walnut Grove area. Um, he followed his siblings. I guess, he, you know, the kids had an aunt and uncle lived in that area. I think it was Charlie's brother that kind of first moved there, and Charlie followed suit, was working, saving money, eventually bought this farm on Brook Cove Road, and that was in 1927. So two years before the murder took place, the family bought the farm and uh, were able to, you know, kind of have a piece of the American dream, if you will. Yeah, some upward mobility there. And it uh, sounds like uh, Mr. Lawson is a hard worker and Definitely. just trying to trying to get more, more for his family and get them more stable. Yeah. Well, you know, Charlie and Fanny had eight kids, which I guess at that time was pretty common to have a large family. And they had a couple of children who... Um, perished at birth or, you know, ma or, you know, didn't make it through infancy, which... So they could have had more than eight. Yeah. So they had a couple of kids who died in birth or died shortly after birth in the infancy, as I mentioned. So uh, they potentially could have had more than the eight kids. But in 1929, they had the children. Marie, she was the oldest. She was 17. They had a son, Arthur. He was 16. Then, as I mentioned before, Carrie... Um, younger daughter, uh, she's 12. Maybell is seven and a son named James, who is four. Raymond, who is two years old. And then a four month old baby girl named Mary Lou. And they lived a very, you know, typical life for a rural family, um, during the pre depression era. They were hard working, you know, probably from sunrise till sundown, working that farm. Everybody had to chip in, pitch in, help out. But, you know, they were still pretty poor for the time. Uh, but most farmers back then were kind of just poor dirt farmers kind of scraping by, and especially those sharecroppers, you know. Yeah, yeah, sharecroppers. You got your paying the rent to the, you know, basically landlord of the land, likely your home, all that tied. Might even be borrowing against the company store to get through the next month before you get paid again. So with that being said, uh, you know, hardworking, but probably didn't have a ton of money. Um, people thought it was kind of unusual when Charlie Lawson took his family to town days before Christmas. He lavished them with brand new clothes and they had a family portrait taken, which was a splurge at the time and uncommon and was kind of seen as a luxury. Uh, times have changed. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so the bloody crime began on Christmas afternoon. As I mentioned, Carrie and Maybell were going to visit an aunt and uncle. And uh, while they were making plans to head out, Charlie Lawson was waiting in the barn. The father, patriarch of the family. And when they drew closer, he shot both of his daughters with a shotgun. My God. He then bludgeoned both girls, presumably to, you know, ensure that they were both dead. And then he dragged them into the tobacco barn to hide the bodies. So you would think the shotgun, shooting small girls with a shotgun, was going to kill them. Well, I guess just to be sure, you know, he uh, he, he decided to um, beat them as so well. It seems he's out of his mind at this point. Well, before this time... Um, that morning earlier, Marie's baking the cake. Everybody's kind of up and at him. Charlie had sent his oldest son, Arthur, the 16-year-old, into town on an errand. And some folks have said that errand was actually to go to the general store in town to pick up some ammunition because they were going to go rabbit hunting, which uh, was actually, I guess, something that a lot of families did on Christmas Day. 
family tradition. It was kind of a thing to go rabbit hunting back then on Christmas Day. So Arthur had gone into town on an errand, and some people have speculated that maybe Charlie spared his son because he knew that Arthur was the one who might physically overpower him during the murders. Because he's 16, he's a farm boy, you know, he's probably got, you know, a pretty strong physique working on that farm. So he was probably the only one that really could have overpowered his father. Other people have speculated maybe he spared his son so that the family name could continue. Yeah, but, but I mean, he's killing his whole family, so I'm not sure that's top of his... Of course, the son would carry the name on, but well, still. At the end of, well, you just that was a spoiler alert, Dylan. Well, at the end of the day, none of us really know, you know, what Charlie was thinking at the time. But once he had hid the bodies of the two younger girls in the barn, he walked back to the house. Now, Fanny, his wife, was on the porch, and I'm not sure if she was on the porch, like, doing some work, perhaps, or if she was just kind of out there you know, enjoying the sunny day or something. I'm not really sure. But Charlie walked up, shot Fanny, then went inside the house to track down his four other children. So once inside the house, he shot 17-year-old Marie, then his two sons, James, the four-year-old, and Raymond, the two-year-old, before beating to death his four-month-old baby daughter, Mary Lou. My God. Now, could you imagine? Because I'm sure there's going to be screams or what are you doing or, you know, a commotion. So all these other children, as he's coming through, systematically destroying his whole, killing his whole family. The terror all the way down to a four month old baby. Yeah. That's that's I've just never heard anything quite like that. And on Christmas Day. On Christmas Day. Which is supposed to be, you know, a uh, happy holiday. Wow. For family and that kind of thing. So after murdering most of his family, of course, save for Arthur, the older boy, Charlie then carefully positioned the bodies. He took the time to fold the arms neatly across the chest, and some um, have described it almost as like how a body would be positioned like lying in a casket. So he positioned the bodies, and he even placed pillows under their heads. And he even took time with the two girls out in the tobacco barn to find a, a rock to place under their heads as if it were a pillow. That's strange. So he's taking a lot of care and attention to these bodies. Then Charlie disappeared into the woods, and of course he took his shotgun with him. So after several hours out in the woods, Charlie took his own life. And by this time, neighbors had gathered at the house and discovered that the family was dead. And the final gunshot was heard by the people who had started to, you know, mill around the property, uh, finding these bodies. Now, do you do you think he was doing that positioning and the pillows all in a, in an act of remorse, or wanting them to be comfortable? Because you know, a lot of times, if they find a body that's been covered with a sheet or anything that at hand, a lot of times that makes invest, investigators think um, someone knew this person. Because I can't stand to see, you know, what's happened. Well, I mean, it almost sounds like here's a, a family man. He's got this family, and he loves and cares for them. He murders them, but he still has enough affection that he, like, wants them to be comfortable. Right. You know, it almost makes me think of the book In Cold Blood, the Truman Capote book. Um, when the Clutter family is murdered, someone, you know, one of the killers takes the time to go and put pillows under their heads and make sure that they seem comfortable. Yeah. Which is just an odd kind of detail. But Charlie's body was discovered um, by a tree in the woods, and he had these letters that were addressed to his parents in his pants pocket, but they were unfinished, and they only contained a couple of sentences that didn't really make sense. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But it appeared as though he had spent some time in the woods pacing a circle around this tree. Like there was a, a pretty decent little like dirt trail path kind of encircling that tree where he had, you know, paced around. So it's almost like he paced around what, what you know, like, oh my gosh, what have I done? Or maybe pacing around trying to figure out like if he wanted to take his own life. Yeah, or maybe he had paced around that tree, you know, previous couple of days in the same spot, thinking about what he was going to do. That's true. I hadn't thought about that angle, Dylan, but that's a good point. But no one seemed to know why Charlie Lawson suddenly snapped and killed his family. 
And of course, at this time, uh, motives, speculations, rumors, of course, 